So welcome everybody to Across the Platform. My name is Paul Rabinowitz and I'm the Executive Director at Arts by the People. Uh, Arts by the People is a 501c3 not-for-profit and we believe that self-awareness and communication come forth in shared creative acts and that the arts offer universal benefits for people of all ages and backgrounds. Exposure through a diverse range of creative mediums can reach individuals and build communities of small interest groups or generate intergenerational connections as well. It's our belief that the arts can also bridge social divisions and strengthen understanding, collaboration, and acceptance in communities of diversity and need. Uh, with public support, we are able to keep our programs free for our participants, and we believe that the arts should be available and accessible to all. So I am going to go through just a few things coming up, and I urge all of you, um, if you can, to please come on board to at least one or two of these. These are really special events that we have in May. And if you get tired of listening to me or thinking that you have to write notes, just go onto our website, go to the events page, and uh, it's all there. But first and foremost is tomorrow night, uh, we have a really special event called across, called Jump the Turnstile, uh, which is a collaboration between choreographers, poets, and visual arts students, um, culminating in a unique live virtual performance. And that's students from MICA in Baltimore, Montclair State University in New Jersey, and St. Elizabeth University here as well in New Jersey. And actually Lynn McHenry, who's hosting tonight is also uh, the person who uh, oversees the poetry portion of her students on this project. And it's really quite an amazing collaboration. It's free, it's open to the public. Uh, just go onto our events page. We urge you to come on and support the next generation of artists. These are all students. May 5th, uh, the platform uh, Literary Open Mic. I know a bunch of you have been there before. Um, May 5th will be our last virtual, fully virtual platform. We're going back to hybrid, or we're going to hybrid, which means we're going back to uh, our space here in New Jersey. However, we have built an international community uh, with our platform of readers from all over the English speaking world. And we're not gonna give that up. So we have purchased a large monitor and we're bringing our laptop and all the virtual folks can come come on board and read uh, in our live space. So that's starting in June. So May 5th, we are saying goodbye to our pandemic and our virtual only platform. Uh, May 9th is another really special event uh, called Intonation. Uh, Lynn is also one of the uh, contributing poets. So is David Cruz. Uh, I hope I'm not leaving anyone else out. Uh, the Intonation Project is a collaboration between North American poets, musical composers, from the Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance, as well as dancers and choreographers from Montclair State University. This is an amazing uh, project, uh, cross-national, uh, across oceans, and across mediums. And I urge you to come out to that, it's May 9th. Um, it's early in the morning because we, or it's 11 o'clock a.m. because we have to uh, appease the folks over in uh, the Middle East. May 14th, uh, we have across, the platform, which is our going back to an outdoor event. So that will be outdoors, socially distant. It's a literary open mic uh, featuring Mel Efres and Dimitri Reyes, uh, and along with Montclair State University's dancers and choreographers. So all of this is up on our website. And the last thing I wanna mention, if you're a New Jersey um, early career artist, you have to be in New Jersey, so sorry if you're not. Um, but come to Jersey, you know, you can move here. Uh, we have a program called Startup, uh, which is um, you have to submit your project. Uh, there's two artists, uh, each will get a thousand dollars stipend uh, and also a place at uh, CCM's uh, gallery uh, for a show in January. So go onto the website, look at Startup, S-T-A-R-T-U-P, Startup, and all the information about submission is there. And it's a really amazing pro a program for, uh, again, an early career artist who wants to have a gallery space and uh, a stipend to help with that project. 
Lynn McHenry. So Lynn McHenry, uh, MFA, is the author of the poetry collection, Some Other Wet Landscape, of which I have six copies. I use them in my writing classes. Her poems have been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and have been twice recognized for the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Award. They have been widely published in journals and anthologies and have been used in collaboration with other creative arts projects. Lynn screens and edits manuscripts for Get Fresh Books for individual poets and for various journals and leads poetry workshops upon request. Born in Yonkers, New Jersey, Lynn lives in Morristown, New Jersey, where she also teaches writing and literature at St. Elizabeth University. Uh, Lynn shares her time collaborating on and curating poetry for various projects with Arts by the People. She is also a friend of mine uh, it's always an honor to have Lynn because she has brought so much to my writing um, career, if you will, and um, she really is someone special. So without further ado, Lynn McHenry. Mm. Thanks, Paul. It's a, a mutual admiration society uh, with Paul and I. We It's been really a gift and a pleasure in my life to come to Arts by the People and be able to um, with David Cruz, who's here, and uh, many other people who you can meet on our website um, to bring the arts out into the world, and especially collaborative arts for, sen for seniors, for young people, and everyone in between. And we try to be rich in voice and um, diverse in culture and age and, and every um, way that we can and invite everybody in is welcome at Arts by the People. Um, so we're really excited tonight across the platform um, is something that came up for us virtually when we had this opportunity to be on Zoom that we could bring people together from all over the place. And tonight we're really excited to bring you four amazing, gorgeous, powerful poets. Um, we have with us Kalisa Ray from Durham, North Carolina, um, Megan Sterling from Portland, Maine, C. Marie Furman from West Central Idaho, and Robin Rosen Chang from right here in New Jersey. So um, we hope you'll um, you know, sit back and enjoy this poetry. I know it will um, feed you and uh, bring you, I, I think, a lot of um, joy and, and challenge and beauty tonight. So our first reader tonight is Kalisa Ray. Kalisa is a poet and journalist in Durham, North Carolina that speaks with furious rebellion. She's the author of Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. It's right here. If you don't have it, you must. It's Red Hen Press uh, 2021, a beautiful book. Congratulations. And her essays are featured in Autostraddle, Catapult, Lit Hub, as well, in, as, well as articles in Bitch Media, NBC, BLK, and others. Her poetry appears in Frontier Poetry, Florida Review, Rust and Moth, Pank, Hellbore, Sundog Lit, Hobart, among countless others. She is the winner of the Bright Wings Poetry Contest, the Furious Flower Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Prize, and the White Stag Publishing Contest, among others. Currently, Kalisa serves as assistant editor editor for Glass Poetry and founder of Think in Ink and Women Speak. Her second collection, Unlearning Eden, is forthcoming from White Stag Publishing in 2022. Uh, follow her on Twitter. I'm going to put it in the chat so you can all get it. And we can find more information at KalisaRay.com. I'll put that information in the chat so you can all have it. So welcome, Kalisa, and thank you for sharing your poems with us. Thank you so much, Lynn and Paul. Oh my goodness, this is amazing to be here. Um, I'm coming to you live from Durham, North Carolina, uh, but I have family in Newark, New Jersey. So love New Jersey people, uh, tons of family in that area. So that's awesome. I will give a, a brief disclaimer. I am under the weather. So if my voice goes out on one of these poems, just send me lots of love and light and warmth. Uh, so I'm gonna read a couple of poems for y'all. Hope that's okay. Uh, this is my debut forthcoming collection. I'm so proud of it. It's called Ghost in a Black Ghost Throat. 
Uh, and it was actually my master's thesis at Queen's University, where I studied with renowned poet Claudia Rankin and Ada Limon. So I worked on this collection with them. Um, and so I urge you, urge you uh, to go get it and, and all these other beautiful books um, from the writers that are reading with me tonight. Um, I think I'm going to start with circus acts because I like to start with pieces that really encompass what my book is about. Um, if you see, you know, any of the blurbs about my book, you'll know that it's about me being a Midwesterner that was born in Gary, Indiana and migrating to the South and the experience of that culture shock, as I'm sure you can understand, being right by Chicago and then coming to little small Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and all of the racism and the prejudice that I experienced when I got there and just some, um, a lot of the trauma, a lot of the trauma that I experienced. So we're gonna start with circus acts and that sets the groundwork and the foundation for uh, what my book is about. Circus acts, no more black girl magic. Black woman, this world will make you circus, freak show, tightrope walker, contort your name from Sarah Barty to Sorarty, Hotep Venus stage performer. Look how they abracadabra the royal exploitation of your form. Watch them dissect your broad bottom, saw you into science experiment. Call your mending magic, your root balm and salve a work of the devil. Go out the trap door and come back in the body of Beyonce, prized possession. They will spit shine the stage for you again. What a spectacular woman, two-headed and omnipresent, one foot here, one foot in Houdini state. Your magic trick is look at all the wonder I can do with two hands and 24 hours. When people say that's black girl magic, say I have no magic. I make mills from crumbs, cast demons with just my tongue, envision possibility from potential that makes me scientist, inventor, chemist, spiritual being. Tell them this is super, this is not super, this is survival. When they call you hero, when they hand you the cape anyway, say, haven't I carried enough? When they call your strength otherworldly, say it is Venus rising in me, purely, and nothing more. Thank you so much. Um, so a lot of this book talks about um, my experience as a woman of color, in the South, um, but also what it is to live at intersectional identities, um, as we all do, right? Um, and so that was really important to me to talk about what it means to um, be a brown body here and live as a daughter, um, you know, as a as a wife, um, as someone who identifies as queer, um, in a place that uh, doesn't accept that historically and that has historical trauma running through it. So we're gonna to transition to uh, collaring our native tongues, uh, which actually, um, I haven't read this. I'm on tour right now for Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat and I haven't read this that I'm reading. Uh, so our side of people is getting the, the first view of this poem. Uh, this is collaring our native tongues. Heard we rattle in the walls, small and rat-tailed rumbles, people ignore. They swear we're just the pipes, creaks in the floorboards. Our native tongues crawl out of tight spaces and tumble into silent cracks. We scavenge for substance, but settle for the need to be heard. Search for the words you try to exterminate. We know the social norms set for us are a trap. Our dirt road desert stories are called trifle, bleeding. When in the dark, you consider us rodent hard to get rid of. You cannot lure us with moldy scraps. We know how to snip out the wrists before appearing full face. Our accents are not welcome here. Presence not loud enough to be heard over your king's English. We like being quiet. That means you must listen closer. But sometimes we'd like to be domesticated, taken out for a walk or to the park to play catch. We'd like to be pet and praised for our silence and how well we obeyed. Um, so when I was at my master's program, I was really blessed to work um, with Claudia and really find the power 
um, in my voice and the power in telling a story, um, even with little digestible bits, um, you know, really painting um, images. And so I want to read Pastoral Blues. It's a, it's a little poem, um, but I think it really encapsulates um, what it is to, to be a Black woman in the South. And so this is um, one of the pieces that won um, the Gwendolyn Brooks Prize. And so I want to read that for you. Pastoral Blues. Our bodies, broken necked, trampled weeds, pushing blades in the backs of the countryside. Our hue, off note dahlias, bouquet in an orchestra of daisies and dogwoods. Each sorrow song hangs open, heavied, and hollow. But these tangled weeds reach skyward, locked information weaving together like ivy. Our placement so intricately woven around each ancient tree, each willow keeping the secrets of centuries, all of them oaks thirsting for the taste of rain. Mm, I just love that image so much. Um, the other thing that my book grapples with is generational curses and speaking about mental health and how that silenced in the Black community. As I um, come to a close, I want to read um, Mind of Missing Parts. This is for my brother. Um, both of us struggle with me mental health and that's something that oftentimes is quelched and silenced um, in our community. And so it's important for me to talk about that today. This is Mind of Missing Parts. These second hands inside our mind tell more than time. Each hour whispers our demise. Each racing thought a spinning facet off track. My brother's unhinging framework and all my unwinding parts discarded. Others pawned off, never returning. I do not know us anymore. I do not recognize our unassembling brains. These days when I feel hollow with no steel, will, or release, I should have thought of Hemingway, Van Gogh, and Twain. How our brains tiptoe on razor's edge, each of them winding into delicate marvels of mechanics, their sanity balancing on hairpin thin bolts, twisted timepieces that keep in sync, whose minds are brilliant still. There should be a special place in the jewelry shop for watches whose faces split into gorgeous fragments, whose missing numbers give them character and rusty hands are exposed, turn them over and see how imperfectly meticulous. I wish my brother and I could be seen as functioning fossils with intricate movement. I wish we could find a shelf that appreciates us for all of our unwinding, a shop where we are valued as gadgets that measure moments that capture time with the broken grass. Hmm. So as I leave you, um, I always, before I go, like to read a piece from my forthcoming collection, which is Unlearning Enid with White Stag. I'm gonna do Catching Bees, it's short. Um, it's after Gerald Stern. Uh, Gerald Stone is phenomenal. And I stumbled across him uh, a couple of years ago, actually, pretty newly introduced to him. and. Uh, wrote a response <laughs> poem to one of his poems. Today, I put my plans on hold to mine the honey bubbling under my lips. Scrape what's left from my thighs and mold a balm for the days I want to feel whole. Sweet sticky in all the hurt places, sealing where a woman was made a wound. There gaping with sap and sugar, I smear layers over cracks my mouth, glazing a brulee of come hither. Today, I need to not spread in both directions, but to be held together by amber. Today, I will draw the queen bee to my hive and bury her in my openings. In helix, I caramelize and ribbon into uneatable candy. Safe is to be wrapped in a swarm of, of invisible set in a trap of syrup. Today, I am embalmed, thick spiced and golden. Hurry and let me harden again. Thank you so much, Arts by the People, for having me. It was a pleasure. I'm so excited to hear my friends follow me.
Kalisa, thank you so much. I wish you could hear everybody clapping. That's the one thing we miss on Zoom, but everybody, here's the book. Please go and get it. We'll put the information in the chat again. Uh, what a gorgeous, strong reading. I love that line, um, whose minds are brilliant still um, in your poem and um, for, you know, bringing awareness to, to mental health is so important, um, as you say, and you know, for people to be able to come forward and, and um, talk about that in such, in such a, a beautiful way you know, to, to open us up to it. So thank you for that and all your uh, gorgeous poems. And I just wanna say, I, I was lucky enough to study in David Cruz with Gerald Stern. He was uh, our mentor at our MFA and he's become a good friend of mine. So I, I heard that poem with uh, pleasure and a personal connection. So I can't wait to see it in print next year. So I can imagine him hearing it and loving it too. So I'm glad you got to share that with us and I got to hear it. So thank you for that and for all of your poems tonight. So once again, Kalisa, Ray, thank you so much. Um, okay. Our next poet is Megan Sterling. Megan Sterling's work has been published in many journals, including Rattle, Sky Island Journal, Glass, Poets Resist, Rise Up Review, Literary Mama, and Enough, Poems of Resistance and Protest, and is forthcoming in Thimble, Momeg Review, and many others. She is co-editor of the anthology, A Dangerous New World, main voices on the climate crisis and is an associate poetry editor of the main review was a featured poet for frost meadow reviews Sp spring 2020 issue a dibner fellow at the 2020 black fly writers retreat and a hen Wokes artist colony resident in 2019 megan's chapbook how we drift was published by blue lyra press in 2016 her full-length collection, These Few Seeds, is now available from Terrapin Books. She teaches poetry workshops and lives in Portland, Maine with her family. Read her work at megansterling.com. I'm going to put that in the chat for you. This is the gorgeous cover of her book. And we welcome you, Megan, and we're eager to hear your poems. Yay, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Kalisa. It's always such a pleasure to hear you read. You're such a wonderful reader of your work. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here tonight. My book is officially out as of April. Yeah. It's a freshie. Um, and my book, so the cover, it's a painting by a Maine artist named Betty Schottmeyer. And the painting is called Snow Melt. And the title, These Few Seeds, comes from the last line of the last poem in this collection. Uh, a lot of my work deals with my experience as a mother of a very young child in bringing her into a world that is facing climate uncertainty, to put it mildly. And it's just been something I've been struggling with since I was pregnant with her. And this book is my way, it's a love song to her and it's sharing with her my fears and my grief for when she's able to read it when she's older, as well as sharing it with other people who I know feel the same way that I do. Um, so I'm going to start with reading um, a poem. I'm gonna read some poems that I usually don't read just because it's a, uh, it's fun. So um, the first poem I'm going to read is a short one called California. And uh, you'll see some of the themes that I deal with in my collection. California is always coming apart somewhere, a fire or a fault in the earth opening itself in love, in ruin, which is to say utterly, this place, Eucalyptus and wide stands, filtering light and exhaust, leaves like wings, the ocean eating the side of the whole state, 
like it can't get enough of those shore pines, shards of cliff jutting out into the Pacific. After all, California is a poem, Steinbeck said, and like many things, he knew, he saw the truth. This place can break you. Cherry flames ripping up the sides of whole mountains, redwood forests ringed in mist. So now I'm gonna take us, we're gonna travel from California, across the country, across the ocean and land in, uh, this is in um, Sweden. I worked on a farm in Sweden. I've lived many lives and uh, this book encapsulates some of that. So um, this poem is called Still Life with Snow. It fell away, that slant of light that followed us across the North Sea across a stable yard, hoof marks sunk into the frozen mud. The way the barn cut the night in two, the hay steaming, the chickens asleep in the roost. I had dreamt us before we ever came to be, clutching the cold like a talisman against the bruising of old dreams, against the inevitable age that would grip us in its fulsome mouth a dog in the yard mawing its one mean bone. And what sky was left was hollowed moon and piecemeal as a memory of what I thought I could be if only love would find me, traveling the Arctic of my heart, gnawing its white bone. So love did find me mostly in the form of my exquisite little daughter who just turned four and she is my muse. I've never experienced anything like it. Just all of the experiences I have with her, I'm constantly finding endless source material for writing poetry. I've been thinking about it. Lo my love for my daughter is the simplest, clearest thing in my life. Um, so here's a poem I wrote for her, Adeline, that's her name. She was named after my grandmother. In our house, we always have dusty window frames, glass jars of tea, loose scree on the walkway. Lately too, small evidences of her. Sounds of sleep, quiet breathing soft as moss on stone the dim roar of the monitor, a small sock wedged beneath a door, agony of any distance. Even in the next room, I dream of her behind my eyes, my belly still holding memory, the sky stripped of cloud, her perfect breath always in earshot, a weather vane, right as rain. Insistent, a dripping tap, running in a rust line down to a drain, in our house, she is near as my cells, in the wood grain of floorboards, cradle of smooth gray walls. <sighs> so my daughter, so many poems about my daughter. And she's just, you know, in that incredible stage of growth, which I guess lasts for quite a while, but you know, one month to the next is just a wild adventure of change. And so this is one uh, um, that I wrote when she was really just starting to feel strong on her, with her legs, when she was probably around two, two and a half. So this is a spring poem from a few years ago, Puddle Jumping. It's so brief, her small hand reaching for mine reflexively, as if my hand grew out of the earth, wherever she is and needs steadying, as if my hand were banister, tree branch, root. We ready ourselves, ladybug rain boots with the big gash in the rubber, flowered raincoat just now too short in the arms. She dashes forward on unsteady legs, seeking the puddles as if thirst drove her. 
The biggest one gathers at the grate, flecked with orange dirt like iron rust that glows beneath the rushing. She wants me near her to delight with her, to exclaim that this puddle is big, this puddle is dirty, this puddle is cold. As she stumbles, she splashes, she seeks my hand in the air. So I live in Maine. Um, I married a Mainer. I met him in Asheville, North Carolina, which is where I was living one of my many lives in an Airstream trailer, writing poetry. And uh, he whisked me out of that life into my life presently. <laughs> and uh, we moved to Maine and the first winter I was here, well, the first two winters, this winter was all right, but they're a little sh shocking. So I wrote a poem for winter and it's a uh, hiver mon amour, where I'm trying to, I'm trying to seduce winter into giving me a break. Winter, take me into your arms, the folds of your white sheets, long gray lines, pavement shivering, dark as slate under heavy feet. Winter, the coffee shop windows are fogged. I cannot see your steel face, gaping horizon like teeth. Winter, hold me wet and stunned. Cover me in flannels, wools, and sheepskins, gently pressing snowflakes into the hair that frames my face, alive and wild in air as dark as water. Let your ice give shape to my thoughts. Your winds whip my eyes into seeing what I never do, what I couldn't until you came and stripped the world naked, your gaze like judgment, your touch like stone. How much I've lost since we first met. I've been spinning. Keep me still, winter. Love me into the hard, hard ground. I had fun writing that one. I actually wrote that one at a coffee shop. It was bleak winter outside. The coffee shop was fogged. You know, you kind of feel trapped inside the space. And I was like, that's it, Winter. You and me, we're gonna have a talk. And that poem was born. Um, it's been interesting since I had my daughter, I had my daughter at 38 and having a child later, a little bit later is this wonderful experience in not giving a crap about anything. You just, it just strips everything away. And so when I hit 40, that really, really became true. And so something I was thinking a lot about was becoming more and more truthful in my poetry, because I'm just not afraid of what people will think anymore. If I feel tender, I'm going to be tender. If I feel simple, I'm going to be simple. If I want to tell a horrible story, I'm going to tell it. And so I wrote this poem, Blada, genus cockroach about kind of this transformation in a sense from being someone who liked to hide into someone who tells the truth and the difficulty and recognizing oneself in that. So anyway, here's Blada genus cockroach. I feasted on leavings, hidden, sorry, my teeth yearning for the fruit to taste what was plainly offered. Could it be I now refuse to obey the orders of the long dead? I was shown the full skirts, the wigs, the chaos drawn like order in the sand. I spent instead my shiny dimes on pens and shoes with heels. I, the mute one with the fierce sweet tooth, always playing seeds like a flute between cracked teeth hand holder, plate weaver. I have lost my taste for rot. I have crept like a roach in the darkness to tell the truth with these hideous wings, this coward's heart. And I think I'm gonna read one more. I am, um, 
So I've been a traveler in my life. I remember before when I was struggling, should I, should I have a child? You know, should I, should I not? I uh, took a solo trip to um, Peru and hiked the Inca Trail. And I thought, I will discover the truth on this hike. I will see it. It will become clear in the earth and in the rocks. And it did not become clear. I looked and looked and it didn't come. And I remember standing almost to Machu Picchu and looking at a sunset. And I was like, all right, no sign is coming to me. This is an adventure, the kind of adventure I've spent the last 20 years pursuing. And having a child is an adventure that I have never experienced. I have to do the thing that I've never done. And that was my answer that I came to. And so this poem, How to Travel Alone, is a little bit of that full circle. How to travel alone. You must be ready for long silences, trouble finding bathrooms, short, intense attachments to strangers, the attention of unsavory men. Bring moleskin to cover blisters, an unlined journal, pens that won't bleed in shifting cabin pressure, tarot cards to guide the journey. Prepare to hear the stories of other lonely travelers and grow to love those stories. Use them as if they are your own. Begin to forget they aren't yours. Learn of your grandmother's death while in Helsinki. Grieve along the smooth gray rocks at the shore. Throw stones into the sea and imagine they are piercing the veil between you. Get invited into a Swedish home for Passover. Encourage British children in the timeshare in Portugal to henna your hair. Run your fingers through loose bones in a pitch dark catacomb. Lose yourself in busy cafes and be surprised by who you see in the mirror. Feel so alone your skin aches. Over quinoa soup, regale an Australian couple with descriptions of the American North, wharves, Streets caked with ice like ash, the ocean a bottomless black all winter. Forget the times you turned away from a shadowed alley, from an outstretched hand, the times you were afraid. Let those untaken paths remind you of the choices that brought you right here, your luggage gathering dust. Thank you so much. You can get my book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or all kinds of places. <laughs> These few seats. Yay, Megan, that was so beautiful. The book is here. I put Megan's link to her uh, website in the chat. We can put it in again for you where I'm sure you can find uh, the link as well. Um, I'm so moved by your reading. My life experience is kind of the opposite. I had my kids when I was 19 and 22. And so I had never really been anywhere in the world and my family, we didn't have that opportunity. And just now, you know, these last 10 years or so, I'm finally getting to travel. So it's what a joy it was to really have you kind of take me around the world and then back to those, those you know, innocent feelings of my kids when they were so young. So I, I feel so full and like I've been so many places in my, you know, in my own life and around the world. So thank you so much for that beautiful reading, Megan. Okay, <laughs> next we're moving on to C. Marie Furman. C. Marie is the author of Camped Beneath the Dam, Poems, Floodgate 2020, and co-editor of Native Voices, Tupelo 2019. She has published poetry and nonfiction in multiple journals, including Emergence Magazine, Yellow Medicine Review, Cutthroat, a Journal of the Arts, Whitefish Review, Broadsided Press, Taos International Journal of Poetry and Art, as well as several anthologies. 
C. Marie is a regular columnist for Inlander, the translation editor for Broadside Press, nonfiction editor for High Desert Journal, and director of the Elk River Writers Conference. C. Marie teaches in the Nature Environmental Writing MFA at Western Colorado University and resides in the mountains of West Central Idaho. And I've had the pleasure of, um, I've been reading this Floodgate Poetry Series Volume 6 with um, C. Marie's work in here. You really have to um, get this as well as her other work. And I'll put her website in the chat. And we're so happy to hear your poems, C. Marie. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I, I almost feel bad that I'm reading because I've just enjoyed these two readings immensely. Um, Khaleesi, your voice is powerful and beautiful and strong. And, and what, uh, what an honor to hear you. And Megan, you just delight me. I hope someday we can be best friends and um, you will write a poem about me like you've written about those places because that's, that's just beautiful. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks to, to um, Arts by the People and Paul, and it's so good to be here. David Cruz for introducing me to this group of people. I dearly appreciate that. And, and I, um, I'm delighted to be here. So thank you um, for coming into my work room with me, my work workout room, um, and being in Idaho tonight. I know that there's Montana represented here, but not so much Idaho. And that, that's also, it's important to me to say that um, as I sit here in Idaho, I sit on Nez Perce Nimipu land. This is also land of the Shoshone Paiute and Shoshone Bannock. And I know that we are virtual, but we are still crossing line that belongs to so many indigenous tribes um, across the US and, and maybe even further. But if you put your feet on the ground tonight, maybe you can say a little something to those grounds that very much miss their people even as they are still in, in the region. So um, thanks to, to those tribes for being such good caretakers of the land before we were here. Um, I almost feel bad ruining this wonderful air that Megan's created, but I'm, I, have to, I have to go with the truth as she so, so nicely put it for us. And um, I'll start you then with a warning, a poem called Litany. I got a rattlesnake in me getting fat on swallowed words. I got a rattlesnake in me. It bites the heart that warms it and numbs it to the teachings of my mother who said, don't say anything unless you got something nice. I got a rattlesnake in me. Stuns my ability to speak only when spoken to. I feel it split tongue strum. I got a rattlesnake in me whose cool coils circle my spleen digesting complacency spilled in the pit of people pleasing, no sense in arguing, speak in a quiet voice. Do you know who you're talking to? That is no way for a lady to, I don't remember asking you. Keep the peace, pleasant company, minority, diplomacy. Please don't upset anyone. I'm warning you. Shh. Honey gets more bees, but I got a rattlesnake in me. Can you hear her? I got a rattlesnake in me drinking vinegar, swallowing concessions, whole. I got a rattlesnake in me teaching me how to sense danger, handle me carefully. I got a rattlesnake in me tired of being held up, proof of domination, tired of losing this venom for protection. Every day I remind myself, I got a rattlesnake in me. No more to be poked with sticks, no more to meet the edge of the shovel. I got her skin in me. I got a rattlesnake in me. Just like tall grass, calm rivers, and fields of wildflowers, beneath this friendly front porch, watch where you step. So a lot of um, the poems, all of the poems I'm going to read you tonight are based on, um, on my body and the bodies of many Indigenous women um, throughout North America that have been hurt and lost and are missing and have been treated um, much like the land has in, in ways that we've been given away, we've been taken away, removed and, and um, violated. And in the 
the, starting in the late 1950s up until the 1980s, when many of us were alive, Native women didn't have rights to their bodies. Um, often they were sterilized. We had children taken away from us. Uh, young girls would go in to get a tonsillectomy and come out with a hysterectomy. We lost 75,000 children possibly during that time until, until the 1980s when it was um, no longer legal to perform experiments on the bodies of Native women and, and other, um, other women as well, Black women's bodies, Mexican, and those in a lower demographic. So many of these poems come from that, and I'll start out with the lead, The Problem of My Body. And it starts with an epigraph. They took our past with a sword and our land with a pin. Now they're trying to take our future with a scalpel. I am trying to solve the problem of my body. You are unnerved by my presence. Examine me the way airports search for weapons. You look at me as if a thing you lost can be found in the brown of my skin, beneath the round of my breasts, and lower until your eyes become scalpels and my body is clay you unsculpt into your ideal. The first cut wrinkles my skin from belly button to pubis. A routine examination, you'll say, but there now beside you lies my uterus, then ovaries, which you hold like a wishbone, and my hands tied by your doctrine cannot grasp the other side as you grunt the muddy wish of generations of white men and women who claim to civilize this land. What knowledge lies for you in my body that you would carve at it like you quarry for silver, like you dredge streams and frack shale bones and dam the endemic rivers. For your power to rise, Codicus in hand, an unholy missionary's key that privileges your transplantation into this land, this body that you pin back together with promises, threats, and then hang as ripe fruit from the limb of a tree. Acknowledge me as evil, even as you try to claim your own rib. You are Adam and Adam and Adam and Adam and Adam and Adam, and the snake is of your making. I am not your Eve to be banished to an unbarren Eden. I am trying to solve the problem of my body and why in God's name that deceiving is your answer and why when I look to God, I see only another way that you can proclaim the land of my flesh as your own. And when I look to science, I see only validations for your cuts. And when I look to the law, I see acts in the name of Indian health services. And when I looked to the tree, I'd see its trunk split and scarred. And when I look to the rivers, I see reservoirs of reservation salmon dying and dying and dying. The problem of my body is that it was your last frontier. And when it is no longer fit for experimentation, for exploration, for damnation, I will not be able to recognize it. I will no longer know this earth. The problem of my body is colonization. The problem of my body is that it is stolen. The problem of my body is that it is a reservation. The problem of my body is that it reminds you of paradise. And sticking with um, the body poems, I wrote a letter to my body. Um, many of these poems came I have a fantastic teacher named Alexandra Teague, and I got to work with her at the University of Idaho, where we have a, an amazing um, collection of, of writers there. I worked with Bob Wrigley, who was also wonderful, and Michael McGriff. And um, Alexandra taught this class about persona. And she read to us you know, several different persona poems and, and women writing in these voices. And what I found it did for me wasn't so much give me a different woman's voice to write from, but it allowed me to write from a different voice of my own, like to um, put on a mask of something I was uh, afraid to speak in other situations. And so many of these poems came from that time and it, it felt like the persona was a permission to get angry when I'm normally a pretty soft-spoken and as an indigenous person, not allowed to be angry in many spaces, but through poetry, we can do that, which is a wonderful gift of, of the poem. 
Dear body, it was never your fault. It was not how you were dressed, not your fault you developed full breasts and savage hips at a young age, or that your uncle said, look at that swing, as you walked in front of him, age eight. Dear body, it is not your fault that wearing a short skirt puts you in jeopardy, that the brown of your skin puts you in the minds of others that call you exotic, consider you easy. And that because I believed them, I spread my dear legs. Dear legs, I know you wanted to run. Dear heart, forgive me for trying to fool you and body forgive me as we try to forgive Disney for sexualizing Pocahontas, as we forgive whomever perverted the word squaw, invented the ridiculous buckskin, buckskin mini dress that appears on a tan body in every single John Wayne Western. Dear John Wayne, I forgive you for hating horses, but I don't forgive you for using fake Indians to manifest your big screen destiny. In fact, I don't forgive you for using Indians at all to make cowboys and killing iconic, heroic. But I forgive myself for the time when I was 12 and saw you swagger across the TV and thought you were a real man, the kind of man I would be safe with. Dear real men, I am thinking about what the term real means, particularly to my body, specifically my blood, Wherein lies the DNA of generations of native women who now address you, who now charge you with an explanation for the scars of your scalpels and your slurs. If real equals strong and strong equals powerful by which I mean someone who decides what happens to others, then I address you. But without salutation, because no salutation is unkind enough to address the decisions you made about our dear bodies. I am talking to you, policymakers. I am talking to you, George H.W. Bush. I am pointing my finger at your chest, your dear body, which is still, so far as I know, intact, or at least was when you suggested a bill to Congress, which was passed by Richard Nixon, that allowed doctors to remove the uterus, ovaries, womb, ability for Native American women to reproduce as many as 60,000. Our population fell by 75%. I am talking to you and the America that allowed it. Dear America, I forgive you because dear America, we are still here, still fighting for rights to our bodies, for our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, dear sisters, Dear uterus, dear womb, dear legs and hair and eyes and breasts and glorious brown skin and luck of being born native in a naive America, the cuts were deep but not fatal. We are still here, still dear, dear body, dear bodies, dear, dear bodies. That one, uh, you know, I know this has got a be for other writers as well but I reread that and I get so pissed off when I you know it's to say it must be like a little poem PTSD but it just remember doing all the research for this and sitting in this small room in Port Townsend and and just being overwhelmed and um distraught and as a as a woman who was born in the era when this was happening and as a woman who's who was um whose mother suffered some of this um i'm sure that i have generations of dna that that are are feeling that trauma inside of me and for the most part they were called by this word and the word is squaw which is also the title of this poem and let the word clear my throat squaw i hold the s a little longer than i should let the q push against my back teeth and land flat against my tongue and back of my closed throat. The final sound does not move my lips. I say squaw again, and I feel it on my thighs, climbing back inside of me, finding safety in my ovaries, searching for its home in my blood, in the gentle lining of my scarred cervix, where a decade of knives, sterilized, tried to clear up this Indian problem. Squaw. And I hear it from the lips of white men. I hear John Wayne run it over his big cowboy teeth like the hungry tongue of a weasel whose eyes alone molest. And I wanna steal the words back 
from his swaggering mouth, put it inside my big woman bones, hide it in my marrow, feed it back to the mouths and the bodies it was stolen from, put on maps where it's a valley, a peak. This earth body is where it belongs, but not lying with bold face and colonizer claims, ill-gotten lands named Nigger Dick, Chink Creek, Jewtown, never belonging to those bodies, misnomers where white skins kill mule deer, ride snow machines, drag trout from our lakes and say squaw, like they are saying woman, like they are saying Tuesday, like they are saying nothing at all. One more happy poem for you. Sorry, not sorry. I um, I'm reading this one for Paul, who has become a, a just a dear friend of mine, and I've exchanged some wonderful emails with, and um, it's just amazing and lovely how words bring us together and build these friendships, even if um, those friendships aren't face to face. And so someday, I hope, I, I've been to New Jersey once in my life, the first time I ever read a subway, it was two years ago, um, it might be the last time, but it was, it was an extraordinary experience. So um, Princeton was nice enough to have me over there and I got to, to, to speak at Princeton for a second. I never even thought, I, I didn't know where it was when they invited me. I was like, is that in the States? So yes, yeah, so over here in the West, we are a little bit maybe um, naive to what happens in the East. This poem is from one of my favorite places in the West a place called Hell's Canyon that is just about an hour and a half from where I live and is the deepest gorge in the United States. So Grand Canyon likes to make that claim. It's not true. Hell's Canyon. Camped beneath the dam. Camped beneath Hell's Canyon dam last night, it started raining. I moved my head outside the tent and let rain fill the hollows of my eyes. I never saw lightning, but heard thunder roll from beneath me, the earth upside down, hooves of animals bolting through clouds. It started raining lamprey and sturgeon. It rained so hard last night, I was young again. It rained so hard, the earth moved from the graves of my grandparents. Their bones started dancing on the rocks, dancing like hail. It rained so hard the river was young again. Neither of us had our second names. We chewed dirt with our first teeth. We ran together with salmon, steelhead. The shores lifted their skirts in our passing. Last night, the rain brought back my grandmother. She put my head in her lap. She told me stories. She told me carp sucked the bones of my grandfather. Her tears filled my eyes. Her braids tickled my cheeks. This morning, the skies are clear. A fly dances on my nose. I move earthworms from the trail. Sometimes I toss their wet red bodies back into the river. Thank you so much. Wow. See, Marie, that reading was just so moving and powerful like you said after each one of you i i don't know how to go on um i'm ready to hear robin but i you know i almost can't wait for 9 30 so i can spend time on my own with the four of you and um i feel like these are the books the the three the the readings that we've heard now and robin's coming up these should be our history lessons these should be our history classes not the books that we have and these should be our current conversations with our students about about contemporary times and what's happening all as well um i, I feel like uh, i'm traveling across and i just am learning how to meditate and when you talked about the feet on the ground um, uh, um, and, and some form of prayer or remembrance for the indigenous people, um, I, I take that to heart. I, I felt it inside and, and that will stay with me um, as I continue that practice. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, oh, I got the chills a little bit. Uh, okay, Robin. We're so excited for you to bring us home tonight, Robin. Um, Robin Rosen Chang is the author of The Curator's Notes, 
a full length poetry collection published by Terrapin Books 2021. Hooray. Uh, her poems appear or are forthcoming in Michigan Quarterly Review, The Journal, Diode, North American Review, Poet Lore, Cream City Review, Valparicio Poetry Review, and other literary journals. She received the Oregon Poetry Association's Fall 2018 Poets' Choice Award, an honorable mention for Spoon River Poetry Review's 2019 Edi Editor's Prize, and a 2021 Pushcart nomination. Robin has an MFA from the Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College. She lives in New Jersey, so we're bringing it home, where she teaches college-level ESL and tutors. She can be found online and I'll put that information in the chat so you all have it. And thank you, Robin. We're excited to hear your poems. Thank you so much. I'm actually, all of the three of you that came before me just totally blew me away. And I'm a little intimidated now, but I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna read. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for your amazing voices. That was just, incredible. Um, I'm just going to read some poems. Some of them I've read before and some I don't usually read out loud. So let's just go. First poem is um, called My Mother Was Water. She used to say they didn't know how she got pregnant with me because my father was married to his work. I think about them how he and his work might have dined together, my father in his blue and white polka dotted bow tie, across from work, a mess, demanding, look at me, I need you to do this now. And where they would have slept, the space work took up in bed. But really, I know my mother, so turbulent, she was water, a river, torrid and trying to flow uphill and he a dam at the bottom imploring gravity pulled down her wild current. I think I was a pebble lodged between them too light to lodge myself in the silt. I decided to be a fish brown and speckled to camouflage myself in mud and rocks refusing to swim upstream or downstream. I wondered about land, how hospitable it might be. Sorry, having trouble getting to the next page. Um, my book has um, several different threads that are um, intertwined. And one of them is actually, thank you. One of them is actually, um, a creation series. So um, see, Marie, I, I have a, a persona poem from the voice of the snake. And now I want to read it, but that's not not on my <laughs> not what I've indicated here for myself. So this poem is called Motherless Eve. Motherless Eve didn't bear her mother's burden. Depression, paranoia, nervous breakdown, Afternoons sleeping in, bedroom curtains pulled tight. She was never a last child with a single mother finding herself as her own breasts were starting to round, her blood beginning to flow. She didn't have to endure her mother's obsessions. What a stranger or daughter said or how she looked at her that day, or three years ago, or what will happen next week, or men and men, a boyfriend or more Eve never liked. She didn't have a mother who worried about birds, the mallard too far from water, or who knew that robins have such lovely songs. There was no nest, in a bush by a window, there was no window, no four blue eggs, no hatchlings.
shorebirds. Motherless, Eve watched the shorebirds, flocks of red knots in flight, darkening the sky. She noticed their rust-colored bellies when they alighted and how they strutted up and down the Cape May beach, feeding on the small green and gray pearls of horseshoe crab eggs, not much larger than the grains of sand they were plunked into. But Eve didn't know the birds would eat until they doubled in weight, then take off again, or that nesting mothers would leave their young before the chicks could fly. She didn't realize the low pitch and quick uptick of their calls, poor me, poor me, were not cries, but songs. There was so much she didn't know about birds, about the subtle imprint a mother makes, like the bird's footsteps besides the ocean's spoon, the positive space in the negative, the blue between their airborne bodies. This next poem is called Riptide. Riptide. My mother's arm reaches out of the water and slides back in. Then the other arm. Repeatedly, they appear and disappear as they move her through the turbulent ocean. She's swimming diagonal to the shoreline, almost like someone caught in a riptide, but she's not. She's going calmly of her own volition, retreating from the beach where I lie. I squeeze my shut eyes hard. A sliver of her face appears, a waning moon when her head turns after every second stroke. Her mouth opens just enough to pull an air that holds life in her. Fixed on something she seems to see, she keeps going. She doesn't struggle. The current doesn't batter her. It doesn't carry her off. She's a white spot in the water. She's taking herself away. Um, so I wrote these actually, as I guess you can tell, this book explores um, a lot of emotions and feelings related to loss. Um, so, and the Adam and Eve thread was sort of a, a foil, a way to access some of the, um, some of the matters that I was trying to write about. Um, sure, liturgy. I get up early for it. Sandpipers rushing to the surf, poking their long beaks in and out of the sand little sewing machine needles until a wave churns and they turn, run, then turn again, run back to the swash, their skinny legs moving too fast for their pitched bodies. They repeat this ritual until it's ceremony. Scurry, poke, poke, turn, run, turn. Scurry, poke, poke, turn, run, turn, or together lift off a pure silver cloud. I'm gonna um, finish, I have two poems left. Um, one is called Apple. What if they never touched it? Never wanted to disturb the bees swarming the orchard Sticky before pollinating the many fruit trees, fat figs, blood oranges, 
pomegranate so red they made the apples look brown. Some people say it was olives they weren't to eat or seeds, those sunflowers in the garden, a distraction. Adam wanted to play hide and seek, so Eve crouched between the stalks while he ran in circles, searching wildly, you hooing every few seconds till he stumbled over her. And who needed knowledge? It was overrated, thinking about free will, existence, their role in the garden. What was the point? Perhaps it had been apricots they weren't to eat. Gold, yes, but pulpy and a bit tart. Or what if there'd been no forbidden fruit? All those sermons and great art, Michelangelo's ceiling, Bosch's left panel, Durr's engraving, the fall of man, Adam and Eve, curls in their hair, privates sheathed by giant leaves, Eve receiving a palm-sized globe from that twisted serpent. What if it had been a stone? And I'm going to finish off with um, a poem called When My Husband Says Something About Desire. When my husband says something about desire, I think about the moon and the body as if it were pure ocean full of driving energy, its tides rising and rising before they collapse into spoon. I think about the way the full moon's glow spurs passion and lust, even in animals, a frenzy of mass spawning, Carl too many to count all spewing their seed into the great barrier reef on the very same luminescent night or the eagle owl revealing its secret white neck feathers as it calls out for its mate. What's more, the moon's name. In Spanish, luna, so seductive. The tongue touches the, the, route, the mouth's roof before the lips protrude to form the ooh sound inviting another's lips in, which brings to mind my love and how he thrums his tongue when he rolls his Spanish R's. Amor, have you noticed the moon so bright tonight and how Luna ends in ah? Thank you. Wow, Robin, what a gorgeous reading. Oh, um, I got hung up on the question, what if it had been a stone? And I think, you know, your whole reading, I, I write a lot about loss and the ocean uh, for me is, is that place too. And you brought us to uh, something that can be very familiar and then very new and, um, you know, a stranger at the same time, inviting us to to see it in all of these new ways. Um, it, it, just a, a, a gorgeous reading with the birds and the tides and your mother's arm. The images uh, for me were so profound and beautiful. So thank you so much for those poems, and thank you all. What what a uh, what a what a wealth and what a fullness um, we have tonight, you know, uh, and all the sharing that has happened has been uh, just so wonderful. What a gift. Um, I'm going to open it now for some questions. If we have a few minutes left, we have about 10 minutes left. If anybody um, who's here with us tonight has a question that they want to um, drop into the chat, um, we can talk a little bit to our poets before we have to say good night. Um, is there anybody who has anything? Paul, I have an odd view of the screen. So uh, let's see if I, okay, I got it in gallery view now.
I'm just thinking about the body so much, um, you know, see Marie that you, you said that. And, um, and then um, Kalisa had, had talked about intersectional identities um, at the beginning of her reading. And I think that was a connection here. You know, we heard all four of you talk about your own intersectional identities and your experiences. So I don't know if anybody, any of the four, the th I don't know if Kalis is still here. I'm sorry she wasn't feeling well tonight. Like her reading was still so powerful. But if anybody wants to say anything maybe about those intersectional I, you know, our intersectional identities and, and how you um, are exploring that in your poetry, maybe? Well, something that um, I know Kalisa and Robin and I have talked about um, is the shifting role from sort of daughter to mother and to just, just the shifting roles of womanhood. Mm. I know for me, writing the work is, I mean, I, I, there are a lot of poems in there that I didn't share that talk a lot about sort of the movement from being a daughter to having a daughter mm. and trying to understand that, like, where, where am I now in this, in this world, in, in my worldview, it suddenly has shifted. And that's why it's for me so much of um, watching the world and, and the warming climate. I mean, our main winter was shorter than ever. And everyone's like, oh, this is great. And I'm like, is it? Mm -hmm. Is it great? I don't know that this is great. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, just, just trying to understand oneself through the lens of understanding our forebears, our ancestors, right? Like C. Marie talks about so much. And I actually talk about that a lot as well. I talk a lot about my Jewish ancestry and, this sort of suffering in one's DNA that you have to then sort out for yourself. So I know for me that I make sense of all of these things. I weave them all together in these poems because I don't know how else to make sense of like who I am or what I am. Um, so that's one one offering. <laughs> Does that answer the question? I don't know. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or comments they want to share? And Paul, how about you? Well, I do have a question uh, for C. Marie, actually. Um, so I've been reading a lot of C. Marie's work um, over the last two months. And I'm actually interested in learning more about the themes that you spoke about uh, or you read uh, about tonight. And you spoke about a little bit also. Mm -hmm. um, my knowledge of uh, Native American uh, history between the 1950s and 1980s is not strong. And I, I love history. I read a ton about history, but I'm wondering if there's any um, anything written books that I could access about, particularly what you were talking about, because it is powerful. And it's, as Lynn mentioned, it's something that in school, we're not really focused on, and certainly I don't know enough about it to, um, to talk about. It. I'd like to know more, so I'm just wondering. Thank you for asking that, and mm -hmm. um, always grateful when people want to have a deeper understanding about, um, about indigenous people of, of North America. Um, there is a book in the making coming out. So of course, between, you know, until probably the 1970s, Native voices were just not heard. They were not in print. It, the only time that, that Native people appeared was to dance in front of white people or to, um, to be a spectacle and not in a leadership role or having a voice. So a lot of that is hard, but if you um, want to do some research about it, if you um, Google, simply like um, for sterilization of Native American women, you're gonna come across a lot of that. And in that is court documents because many of these families have finally been able to take, um, take the states and the federal government to court. And you'll see that it was George H.W. Bush's like master's thesis to do these eugenics um, programs. 
that were looked at as being um, a really good idea if you can't breed them out, bleed them out kind of thought. So that is all there. Um, and the, it's in a lot of the, the written stories that aren't necessarily considered nonfiction, but in some of the stories by Louise Erdrich or Deborah Magpie Erling or, um, or Leslie Marmon Silco, you can find kind of hints towards that. And I think that it's, it's becoming more and more relevant now with um, the missing murdered indigenous women and girls that is finally getting some attention and how, how our bodies have been stolen in so many ways from the very beginning. So I think those are all good places to start. And I think there are also, there might be some documentaries that are, are coming out too. So more and more it's starting to get attention, but as you can imagine, a lot of that was hidden. A lot of those documents were hidden. And really, you know, I was, I was 10 years old when it became illegal, 10. I mean, we think of like native things and, and in, appreciate that you, you know, you bring up the fact that we look at natives as feathers and leather and we remember them in the stereotypical John Wayne type, mm -hmm. but think of native people. I teach at a university. I teach spin classes. Like it's hard to put those people in those places. So thinking about natives in the 1950s and what they were going through and the fact that y'all were probably alive mm -hmm. during that when this was happening to native people in your United States of America, mm. to, like, I don't know why that isn't a bigger deal. Why people are just floored by this and what is happening to them now. Until recently, the, the women that went missing or that were murdered or the young girls or even men has not been recorded by the federal government. There was no way to track what happened to native women, nothing until like in the last year and a half when the president, the former president signed a bill into action. So that's happening now to us still. Our bodies don't even belong to us. In fact, if we wanna get an abortion on the reservation, it's illegal. We don't own the right to get an abortion. Whoa. Because our, the, the uh, Indian Health Services is a federal government. So we don't have that right over our bodies even a sovereign nation. So there is a lot, I think there's a lot for um, native, native people to talk about, but a lot for other people to also research and find out and, and hopefully put an end to what is happening to indigenous women um, and girls all over North America, really all over the continent. But yeah. thank you for doing that. Sorry, I was a little long-winded. I get kind of passionate about this particular subject. <laughs> thank you so much, C. Marie. Yes. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to share anything before we go? Any questions, um, comments you want to make? I guess then I'll say thank you to everyone so much for such a fulfilling, rewarding, enriching night. Um, your four voices together, um, you know, it just was a, a really beautiful sense of community reading and sharing of, you know, important um, ideas and images and and language um, for us to to um, go sit by ourselves with our cup of tea or whatever tonight before we turn in and uh, really reflect on. So thank you all so much. Um, Thank you, Paul and Arts by the People for giving us this place to be able to come together and share, you know, the voices of four women in, in different places um, to bring us all together and be able to experience this together. Um, what a gift this really is for all of us. So thank you, you know so much Paul and Arts by the People. And really check out the website, artsbythepeople.org. We have so many opportunities like this for you to take advantage of. Paul is working tirelessly to um, make all sorts of experiences happen for all of us. So um, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for um, listening. And um, you know, if people want to unmute and give, give a round of applause or a thank you to our poets, that would be so great. So they hear you and, and see you and know you before we all go. Thank you. And thank you, Lynn. Oh, it's been a gift. <laughs>
Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Lynn and Paul and everyone Thanks. for being here. Thanks, Robin, C. Marine, Megan. I'll leave the chat open for a minute, just if you, anybody wants to see what folks have written about your poem. So I'll leave that open. And maybe we'll post the recording, Paul. <laughs> okay.